structure they should have for employees versus contractors. And in some cases, we help our clients identify the right people and bring them into their teams. That's part of the Next Step Services. The other side of it is our own business model is based very, very heavily on the use of independent contractors, where we have people who are individuals that are independent-minded, that have their own business, and have their own mindset of running a business, that we leverage their skills when it's appropriate. Because we often need a lot of different types of skills, so it's very appropriate for us to bring a little bit of John's expertise and a little bit of Susie's expertise together to solve a client problem. And we do that through a business model where John and Susie are independent contractors and have their own business and are 1099s and we only pay for the services they provide versus employing, if you will, them as sit on the bench consultants. And as we go through the panel and talk more about why use independent contractors, I can go into more of those details. That's me and my relevance. My name is Margo Hasselman. I'm an attorney and I represent employees and sometimes people classified otherwise um, in primarily in employee benefits and other employment law um, issues. So my role is partly as the, uh, the advocate for people providing services here and it's both kind of remind what the laws are doing, why they're here, um, as well as um, you know, talk about some of the circumstances in which um, somebody might come to somebody like me looking for help solving a problem when they've been, when they feel they've been misclassified. Um, so yeah, that's my role. A lot of some of the cases that I've done in this arena have come out of the pension plan context. Um, and so one thing I'm going to I'm going to mention is that it's sometimes it's in a situation where the entire business model of the company is based around a classification of uh, people as independent contractors, like in the FedEx case or. My old firm um, sued Super Shuttle for in a similar situation. They were classifying their drivers as franchisees. Um, and then in other contexts where I've done cases where it's actually a larger company um, and it's not the business model, but they've got some people at one desk who are classified as employees and the person at the next desk doing the same job and classified as contractor. Um, and where due to either corporate bureaucracy or um, iffy decision making at various points, there have been, you know, people who were maybe supposed to be a temp, but then, you know, stayed for eight years. <laughs> and um, that, that's sort of a situation that I just want to mention for anybody here who works for a larger company or who counsels companies. Um, these kinds of violations don't, um, when we see a violation, it's not always because it was a business decision to base a model on it. Sometimes it really is just a matter of um, sort of uh, sloppiness. <laughs> um, yeah, but my you know my overall role is to kind of talk about what the what the purpose of these laws are, what are the problems for the employers, problems for the employees if the classification is improper. Awesome. Uh, my name is Darren Chappay, and I started a company called PaperCheck. So we do editing for books and manuscripts, and our papers, dissertations, anything that's written in the English language, um, German maybe someday. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> at this point, we, we don't have that option. Um, but essentially, uh, you know, we've edited everything from Dear John letters to uh, Fortune 500 uh, press releases. And you know, when I started the business, I was actually informed that contractors were the way to go. Um, actually, by the Internal Revenue Service, and it turned out that wasn't the case. But uh, for you know, 12 years or so, I built the business using contractors, and then in 2013, I switched over to W-2s, which was a, a very painful process. Uh, but one that, at this point now, has really helped, I think, as we've grown as a business. I'm Jennifer LeBlanc, and I run Think Results Marketing. And we are, like Jennifer, our model is very much dependent on the 1099 model, so I'm sort of the rebel here. We'll be very careful with the lawyers in the room. <laughs> <laughs> So I want, I'm on your side. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was chatting yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can help. <laughs> um, so really, I'm here because I have a passion about why the 1099 model works, and why it works for the workers, and why it works for the businesses. And I think there are some very important um, pieces. I understand there's definitely risks, and I, when I heard Darren's story earlier, I thought, oh, maybe I should rethink my strategy. Um, 
but I think there's some definite benefits, and I think there's parts of the law that really aren't supporting the new worker. Um, so I'm kind of I'm the voice of the new worker. I think here on the panel tonight. So. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, first of all, apologies. Um, those of you who are expecting to see Uta Krudevagen from DLA Piper, she's not very well, I'm afraid. So um, I'm Robert Forsyth. I'm, I'm over here on the comment from Birmingham, England. Um, and I've stepped into her shoes uh, this evening. Um, so in, in terms of my work, I'm an employment lawyer. Um, it's a mix of contentious and non-contentious work. So contentious side means that you know I'm there in tribunal and court fighting battles for, for companies on various um, issues including misclassification or, or otherwise um, and on the non-contentious side you know, we do support on deals, um, projects, day-to-day -day advice. Um, it's an issue that comes up a lot on deals so people have you know, employees or casual workers or agency workers or um, contractors and you know, we all check that out and just kick the tires to, to make sure that that is correct um, and you know, we have a, a number of queries from, from clients who we're putting someone into you know, Singapore, for example, or wherever. We want to do it as a consultant or as a contractor or as an employee. Um, again, we just get the tires and, and make sure you know, it's, um, it, you know, it works. And you know, why do I care about this issue? Um, obviously, it, you know, it's a very top of the issue, but it's very important for our clients. The penalties are you know, severe. Uh, hopefully, I can have a little bit from sort of an international perspective. Um, I can't really add much on the US perspective, I'm, I'm afraid, but um, you know, I know that it's, 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 it's something that's being looked at heavily in Europe at the moment. I've got an example from one of our um, German partners, um, given the audience, just to sort of go through some of the possible sort of ramifications um, for, for when, you, when you get it wrong. Um, and obviously that's our, our role to help to, to make sure that you get it right um, uh, as, as much as you can. Uh, just as a little disclaimer, um, as a firm, we're involved in you know, the UK case in the UK, um, so I'm not going to be commenting uh, on anything to do with Uber um, this evening. I hope you all understand that. But, um, okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. We have a great panel, and uh, I really appreciate you all uh, sharing your time and expertise uh, with all of us tonight. My, my uh, and I don't know how the idea really came up, but this is a very exciting topic because many times when um, I'm called upon to defend. Uh, a company in, in a misclassification investigation uh, or a litigation, I, I just sigh because sometimes there are small tweaks that could have helped and they weren't taken. And so I think it's very important for companies to go into this at least with open eyes, know the risks, understand the depth and the complexity of the subject, which we're not going to tackle tonight. We're going to jumpstart you on the discussion but it, it's a very, very tricky, difficult landscape to navigate, even from a legal perspective. And the point is that as a company, just don't go into it blindly. Just know um, that it's difficult. Know that um, you need help in, in trying to navigate it. Because honestly, it'll save you down the road. That's my opinion. And that's why I'm excited to be here and have these folks share these um, stories and their opinions with you. I want to start out with uh, the business side. Well, um, why do businesses really like the independent contract model? And I'll start with you, Jennifer. So I think it's a couple of things. I mean, for many of our emerging company or small company clients, it's, it's a belief that it is less expensive that we can pay somebody for 20 hours a week, we pay them $100 an hour, and we have a week-by-week -week contract, we have no obligation, we don't have to give them health insurance, we don't have to worry about sick time, we don't have to worry if they stumble and break their toe, there's no worker's comp, so we can save money. That's a very strong perception. Um, where that can fall off is the risk of having an audit, the risk of having a question of did you misclassify those people that are working 20 hours a week? Did you misclassify them as a contractor and not pay for their benefits and pay for their workers' comp? The risk is probably much greater than the 25 to 30 percent of overall employee cost that they're saving. 
And the number is actually important. It's, so it's about, I think, 25% of additional costs that um, companies budget if they have an employee model versus an independent contractor model. Would you, would you that's say that's exactly what it is? We usually advise people consider about 25 to 30% of a burden or an overhead to cover some form of benefits, sick time, payroll cost, et cetera. Administration. Exactly. So it's perceived that the contractor model is cheaper. We'll get into what the ramifications of that can be. Um, the other perception is the contractor model is actually more flexible and safer we bring them on as a contractor, and if they don't work out, we can easily end the contract. And so there's less obligation for long-term connection to this individual. And I would say there is some validity in that, depending upon how you structure the contract and how you manage the contract. There can be more flexibility in how long you're committed to an individual other side of that argument is California is an at-will state. So if you employ someone, according to California at-will law, you could choose to ask them to leave on any given day without any real explanation, and assuming there's no discrimination or other things, they would leave and you're no longer tied to them very different than European countries where there's employment contracts and there's three months severance periods, etc. So perception is you get more flexibility, sort of true, but there's a balance and there's a risk. The other advantage and the reason many small businesses, I would suggest, should think about contractors and the reason we do is by contracting with an expert in a small area, you can truly identify who is the right perfect expert on this topic and use only what you need of that person. So for example, in the area of maybe, not to step on your toes, Jim, but in the area of, of marketing, a small company doesn't need to employ many times a graphic designer because they only need that at short periods of time. Find an expert graphic designer that can be a contract worker. But if it's something broader of a product manager or somebody that's doing something on a long-term basis, then you may need that skill on a longer-term basis. So I'd say the three reasons really to employ contractors are maybe cost, but that's perception, flexibility depending on how you structure it, but third, you get the right skills in the right quantity that you need at the right time by bringing in an expert that truly is a contractor. And, and Darren, what was really your reason for choosing an independent contractor? Was there also a desire to sort of incentivize hard work, for example, if timeliness of the work is an issue? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest reason we did it mostly is because we have, uh, well, right now we have 30 employees, um, which was different when we had 75 independent contractors working for us, or workers, whatever you want to call them, um, and they're registered in every state. So for us to have to be registered in 50 some states, and, or every state, state um, and know international laws and all those kind of things, it starts to become very convoluted when you're just trying to get someone to edit um, you know, an eight-page paper. Like, it seems like a lot of overkill to do that. Um, so uh, I think one of the things that you said is perceived uh, in cost and also I think it's also perceived to be more scalable because I think when you have an independent contract you think oh I just have to hire, you know, hire them to sign this contract and they edit the document and that's the end of the story but it's not really that way because then all of a sudden a day later you get another person who comes in and says oh I have another eight page document or a hundred page document and then you go back to that person and you get the contract drawn back up if you're doing it the right way. And I think this comes into another problem that you, I think you mentioned before, which is just getting your ducks lined up in a row and making yeah. sure that you're constantly doing that, because that's the pitfall you can fall into. It's like, well, this time I sent it to you last time, just send that to me, and then the date's wrong, 
and you're like, whatever, just do it. And then that's where you start to kind of fall into this slippery slope of, of problems. Um, so yeah, scalability seems to be like that perceived kind of look. Um, you also kind of think that it's less paperwork, but it really isn't. I think like once you kind of set up like a W-2 anyway, you pretty much really have the ability to just hire people just as quickly as you would otherwise. Um, specifically, if you're going to be using it, kind of like what you had said, where it's it's, it's more permanent. Yeah. Um, you know, attorney fees. If you don't need an attorney sitting in your in-house to, to do all your legal work, you can do that on LegalZoom or Rocket Lawyer or whatever it's called, or you know, other people in this building, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> For quick things, though, you know, but uh, you also want to hire a janitor. I got a <laughs> I replaced it, but I, I <laughs> <laughs> well, Okay, so maybe a better way to look at it would be like janitorial services. You definitely don't need a full-time janitor sitting in a closet waiting for you to drop something on the floor. So, yeah, <laughs> pretty much for that. Um, so that would be like the other why, another reason why you would look at it. I, I, I think, though, one thing you did mention, though, is people being incentivized. And I think that when you have independent contractors, you're much more incentivized to work harder to be able to go that extra mile to be able to get that extra you know, target bonus or whatnot. Um, and not to like you know, go into the future here about this the panel discussion, but when we had independent contractors, they were editing 20,000 words in an eight-hour period. Um, and when we switched to full-time employees or W-2s, they went from 4,000 to 10,000 words. Dramatic shift in, in, in production and productivity, which meant that our costs no longer made sense and we couldn't afford to cost or charge the smaller dollar amounts that we're doing on a daily or a per page basis. So that really threw everything kind of into this huge flux of problems <laughs> in addition to dealing with the, the inevitable switch that you'll, everyone will have to make at some point, I'm sure. Um, the, the cool thing, though, with having contractors also is that they can subcontract out work. So you, you know, if you vetted one of the contractors, they could go and find other people. And so this way, you didn't have to have like your own HR department, which was really kind of a neat idea. Um, of course, there's all the other things that I think is everyone kind of thinks of independent contractors like PTO, medical benefits, workers' comp, and all those things. But really, I think it's it's just not that much of a cost savings. I think I did it more for a time saving and for uh, you know just the scale or the perceived scalability. Mm -hmm. That's not so less liability potentially at least some companies. Would I would never that. say anything's less liability. Yeah. But there's that's don't take that right off the table. Like the, if you're liable, they'll find a way to make you liable. Yeah, so okay. <laughs> <laughs> they who is they? <laughs> Whomever you want to say. <laughs> they is out there. Disgruntled. <laughs> Independent contractor is as bad or worse than a disgruntled employee. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. Yeah. yeah. So the rebel on the team, what's the... <laughs> Actually, we discussed this, I think, on, on our, our prep call, but I think one of the points and the reason that I went after the 1099 model in the original was, and we haven't discussed this, is that um, employee engagement is, is somewhere between 30 and 40 percent, depending on what you look at. So why would I hire someone and pay them for 100% of their time and I'm only getting 30 to 40% out of them? When I hire a contractor, I'm just getting what I pay for. And I pay for what I get. So I'm able to run a leaner organization and focus my energy on delivering results for clients because we are all aligned on that same result. You know, they're not worried about their 401k packages and their sick time. And they are focused on what I'm focused on. Are we delivering revenue for clients? Are we delivering results for clients? That's what they're focused on. So it's a it's a different mindset. There's there's a, I think a portion of, of the world that doesn't fit well, and I manage mostly creatives. They don't tend to fit well in corporate America. I didn't fit well in corporate America. Um, and having a 1099 model allows for all kinds of benefits in terms of flexibility. And we talked to this a little bit, you know, whether it's millennials or it's, you know, unfortunately women are still doing most of the housework and how do you manage the kids in the house and, and you know, a job where you have to be in the office from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. It just doesn't work. Believe me, I tried it. It almost killed me. I had to, I had to get it on corporate. Um, so I think there's there's benefits in terms of the type of person. I think there's some people that just don't, and I think you'll address this, that just don't fit well in the W-2 model. They fit better in the 1099 model because it gives them flexibility and, you know, I have a programmer that she loves to work from, she's a classic programmer, she works from like 10 p.m. until 4 a.m. Like I know never to call her in the morning because she might have been up till 4 a.m. And so I just kind of like send her a, you know, a Slack message in my and say, can we talk? 
are you up? Because I never know when she's working. I don't care. As long as she's getting it done, I don't care if she does it. She likes to program at night. So that doesn't generally work well in an office. You have to be in for meetings, all that kind of thing. So I think there's a, a an animal that is the 1099 person um, that doesn't fit well in the corporate model. And I think there's flexibility for a lot of people need that for various reasons. You're looking after kids. You're looking after aging parents. You're doing both. You know, there, there's just many, many reasons why a 1099 model works for workers. And I think that's something that we need to make sure that we bring up. And we talked about that beforehand. It's important. So, Robert, I would like to know how it is in the UK or in Europe, uh, what you can speak to in terms of why our business is interested. Are the laws potentially stricter over there than they are here? So, no, you're absolutely right. I and mean, I think in terms of the, um, the, the two issues, the cost and flexibility have been covered, has been covered by the panel. Um, on the cost point, um, employment isn't at will in Europe. Um, you know, you're locked into the contracts, and you're going to have a notice period. You have to pay to get rid of people if they don't perform, if they're not engaged, or they're not up to the job. Um, factoring as well, depending on you know, where you are, which country you're in. Um, there's some quite draconian penalties in terms of if you just get rid of someone because you don't like them, or it's not a fair dismissal. Then you're looking at paying you know, 20, 20 or 30 days per year of, of service on top. Um, and you know, that's obviously a significant cost. Everyone has lots of stories about, you know, I hate I hate employees because you know I, my friend who you know whatever you know, had a, a case brought against him or her, and it, it cost them lots. Everyone thinks, well, you know, I'll just you know, as I you know, as I went as I'm, you know, as I need services, as they can provide services, and I think it does cut both ways. Certainly with the um, you know, the new generation who are all just leaving college, university, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, it suits their needs, the flexibility, they're more mobile, they can do some holidays, there's lots of people that like to do a bit of work, they can go and travel, whatever else, so, you know, if, if the, and I think it tends to be, if you're a contractor, you're probably paid slightly more than you would pay an employee, often, in, in certain sectors, there's a bit of a, um, a bonus for, for some of the lack of you know, protection in terms of rights, so, um, it's certainly, certainly something that, um, you know, in Europe is, 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 is looked at, and I think, um, you know, for example, in the Netherlands, in the uh, year 2000, there were 25,000 um, contractor arrangements in the country. That had risen to a million last year. Now, there's no way that you know, there has been a 975,000 um, increase in number of contractor arrangements. It's being used and it's being abused. That has led to the Netherlands. If you think the uh, US has declared war, then the Netherlands <coughs> did declare war. Right? So that, that there is now a war going on and um, the process for now getting contract arrangements signed off has to be approved by tax authorities and regulator. And you know, you're not going to get it past them. So you know, there are there, there are sort of certain moves afoot. Um, you know, that's a that's a that's a real war. Um, you know, that's the Netherlands is not obviously representative of all of Europe, but um, yeah, there are there are much stricter um, ramifications for having employees. Much harder to get rid of them. In the Netherlands, for example, again, I'm not picking on the Netherlands, but um, if you have, if someone's sick, um, you have to go on paying them sick, sick pay for up to two or sometimes three years. Sure. And there's a reason not to employ employees if you're a startup business. <laughs> you know, we've all had people go off with stress, you know, in inverted commas. Um, and um, so but those are some of the those are some of the factors that can lead to people thinking, well, you know, it's easy, it's, it's just a, it's just a few of us. We're starting up a business, and, and I think what then tends to happen is that these things grow and mushroom. So you start off with two or three people, you end up with forty or fifty, and actually, because you've been so focused on growing the business and and all that side of things, you never really thought about, um, well, is that model still appropriate? Are those forty or fifty people? Are they contractors? Are they agency workers? Are they employees? And suddenly, from out of the blue, something you know, lands on the doormat, and you think, oh wow. I wish I'd looked at that bit more. Or you know, maybe you set it up correctly in the first place, so that you don't need to worry about it. But I think it's not always an intentional decision to, 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 to do it in a in a way that's abusive of the system. Right? Just because that's the way it ends up. So let me put you on the spot then. So yeah. what's the upside for the employee then in Holland? For the employee in Holland? Yeah. Is it more a take it or leave it deal? Yeah, take so it or leave it. So if you, if you want to be if you want to be a part of you know. Jen's company, which is you know, a very exciting prospect, and there's a decent um, rate on the table, and um, you know, your choice is you sign up as a contractor or you don't come as an employee. Well, 
you know, there's your decision. You can go off and work for you know, whichever company if you want to as an employee and get that security. But if you're, you know, if you're smart and you want to, you want to be engaged in that sort of business, then you all say, yeah, great, I'm on board. Okay, and I suppose, I suppose, <laughs> I suppose it depends. If you're, you know, if you depends on who you're looking for. If you're looking for that kind of relatively sparky individual, then it, it might fit for you. I get paid a bit more. It means I can go off and do my month around America in the summer. I don't need to worry about booking the holiday or whatever else. And because I've got, you know, I'm getting paid a higher rate than I would do if I signed for whoever as a as a as a graduate um, for one of the big companies. Then you're know, great. So it's a flexibility. That it's a flexibility. Yeah, I think that's. A, yes, I mean, I, I'm not I'm not part of the um, of that generation, but I understand certainly from the trainees back in the office that you know, they they do like it and it's. So you know, certainly something that we had to sort of look at in terms of giving people, um, you know, sort of breaks uh, at various stages, so they can go off and do the travelling or whatever else. Um, so I guess that's the, it's not a government response, but it's just the companies responding to sort of you know, needs of the workforce. Yeah, and, and Darren, your workers liked the model. That was your perception, the uh, yeah. being an independent contractor. I think it's just it's just much more flexible for them. I mean, I think you kind of talked a little bit about like web developers, and I can definitely relate to that because I don't have all sorts of hours and whatnot. Um, but also just when it comes to like creative types, I mean, they like to set their report, and they want we we never did anything but like eight hour chunks of time. Um, we did it in four hour chunks of time, which seemed to be just about the right amount of time for someone before they started to lose interest in what they were actually doing. Um, so we just allowed people to pick up, you know four-hour collection periods of work, they would do the work and then they would return it if they wanted they were done with it. Um, it gave them a lot of flexibility. Uh, I think also just you mentioned as far as like single mothers, and that was kind of like almost our major demographic was was uh, mothers, uh, expats, we had a lot of expats also working worldwide, they, they were educated here in the U.S. and their husband or spouse or whatnot was working at some major company and this worked perfectly for them. A lot of flexibility and a lot of it worked perfectly for that, that group. Well, second jobs? Second jobs, um, and for sure. I think that there was a little bit toward the end of when it kind of was sort of sliding into that gray area where uh, they, it became more and more dependent upon those jobs because it became more of a, it, it fit their lifestyle. So, you know, when they were contractors, they're making anywhere between 50 to 70,000, especially in a small little place in the middle of Texas and you're doing editing, there's not a lot of jobs for editing at that price range. Um, and you know, conversely, as we went into the W-2s, that same person's making anywhere between 35 and 45,000. That's a huge difference. You know, so you're not getting the same benefits uh, monetarily, but um, and, and you've also lost a lot of the flexibility. So I, I, I feel for them. I wish I could offer that same position. It just doesn't exist anymore. And so we, we talked about creative, so a lot of creative types um, like the independent contractor model. We um, Also I found real estate agents, 80% of them are independent contractors. Um, certainly of the highly qualified uh, physicians, um, there's a percentage that are independent contractors. Um, in the transportation industry, actually trucking industry, there is a huge percentage. I would say, I don't know if it's 100%, but it's a very high percentage. Um, and uh, IT, I find that there's a large percentage of qualified IT professionals that actually prefer to be independent contractors, and they have multiple jobs, they move from job to job. Um, so there appear to be certain industries where this model uh, prevails. Also financial. So say finance, I think, is another big area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's also a very, it's actually 64% of registered financial advisors in the U.S. are uh, independent contractors. So there's some industries where there is a higher percentage um, and that it appears to be by choice. Well, let's, let's talk to Margo here. Well, what's wrong? If, 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 the, if the employers like it and the employees seem to like it, well, what's the beef the government has and, and what's the beef that <coughs> rises in a class action lawsuit. What's what's wrong here? We're missing something. Well, what we're missing are the times that it's not being done right. I mean, so there's, I, I would never take a position, and neither would Tom Perez, that there is no such thing as a legitimate classification of somebody as an independent contractor. The problem is the misclassification. The problem is when you've got somebody who really is an employee 
which is a legal question, a, fa a, a fact-bound, facts and circumstances question that is determined as a matter of law, not as a matter of what label you put on the relationship. We haven't actually talked about what the factors are that and determine talk about that, employee yeah. status, and it, it varies a little bit law to law, whether you're talking about the IRS or you're talking about particular um, statutes that provide what employment protections we have in this country, um, which you know are certainly less than in Europe, as we were just hearing. Um, but you know, there. So I feel like it might be helpful to mention that because a lot of the, the sort of the models that we've heard about at Jennifer's company, for example, um, there's questions about um, what's the permanence of the relationship. Is the person, the the worker, the provider of services? Um, are they, uh, how, how much of their time is spent working for the particular employer? Do they have multiple clients? Or do they really spend all of their time working for this particular employer? Um, is the service that they provide the core service of your company? Or is it an ancillary service? Um, and there's certainly a big question, a big inquiry is always about control over the work process. Um, when it's purely results based, um, that looks more like an independent contractor when somebody is um, is uh, subject to more supervision over how they go about producing those results. That looks more like an employer, employee, excuse me, um, and and how they're paid. If they're paid by the project, that looks more like an independent contractor. If they're paid by the hour, for example, that looks more like an employee. And it, it, they all. You know, rise and fall. I mean, every because every fact situation is unique, um, and so that's why I, I phrase it in terms of well, this sort of pushes that way, and that'll sort of push the other way. Uh, and in the cases that I've done, there's always been some factors that pointed toward independent contractor status. It's almost almost never 100% on one side, um, and so it ends up being a balancing of kind of on the whole, what are we looking at here? Um, that's how the courts decide it. And um, you know, in the cases I've done, they've been employees, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but well, also, I mean, like I said, some of the one of the contexts that I've done this in has been in these large, you know, large employers where somebody was going around a hiring process, or you know, some project group got brought in and then they never left, you know, and they go on from project to project to project, and there's never a discontinuation, there's never an end of one contract and a beginning of a new one. They just keep getting new work, just like anyone else. Um, you know, but we also see it obviously where it's the entire business model, and um, and I think what we've, I mean, hearing from the, both Jennifer's and as well as Darren, I think there are certainly contexts in which it is appropriate when people really do legitimately have control over how they're doing the work, what the work is, specialized skills. That's actually one of the specific factors that's in the analysis. The more specialized the skill that the worker is bringing, the more likely they are to be found to be an independent contractor. So a marketing consultant, a graphic designer, you're going to have a better chance showing that your classification is proper than a driver, than a janitor, than um, you know, a skill that is requires less education, um, for example, less specialization. Um, so there are certainly contexts where it's appropriate and there are others where it isn't. And so I mean, what it comes down to, like with most legal questions, is if it's not a problem, if the people are happy, then you don't have a problem. Where you do have a problem is where it's not really a real choice. You know, as I mean, I think Robert's statistic about the Netherlands is really fascinating because, you know, are all of the, is that really that there's been this thousand? I can't do the arithmetic in my head. Thousandfold interest in suddenly people having an entrepreneurial yeah. lifestyle. <laughs> Maybe more likely that's what the option is. More likely, they're being told this is the arrangement. I mean, you know, so I don't know because I'm obviously prejudging from the outside. But there are certainly situations where it's not because it's the worker's choice. It's because the employer has said this is what the deal is. Um, I mean, I've seen people who were actually reclassified. They were employees one day, and then they were called into their manager's office and told, "Congratulations, you have the opportunity to go into business for yourself. We will see you on Monday." You know, and they're just you know, kicked, they're told to form a corporation and show up on Monday. I mean, you know, so that's, and that's an abusive situation. That person was not choosing that arrangement and they're losing a lot of rights. Um, on, well, there are also, are yeah, what well, that's what I was going to, that's what I was going to turn to. I mean, there are places also, I think, um, and to just speak a little bit about why does the government care about this? What are the interests? These are, 
Um, this is about making sure that people are covered by the protections that the country that the states have decided need to be in place for the employment relationship, which for many, many people is a relationship of very unequal power. People do not get to negotiate. There, most people do not get to negotiate a contract. You do not get to um, set all the terms of their employment. And we have, you know, in this country, we don't have a requirement of just cause um, firings, right? We, you can be fired your at will unless your a contract says otherwise. You can be fired for any reason or no reason, just not an illegal reason. And um, the illegal reasons are set by various federal and state statutes for the most part, and they cover employees. Um, so, and if, when a person is going into a work arrangement, that's not going to be one of the things that they want to think about, right? This is a positive time, we're starting a new job, um, and you're not thinking about, well, what's going to happen when um, my shoulder gives out from all the typing? What's going to happen when my boss sexually harasses me? What's going to happen when I have to take time off to care for my ailing parent? and you know, my, my job is not going to be protected. Um, people don't want to consider those things. I totally get it. And that's why we have a few minimal paternalistic setups where they say, no, you don't get to waive your rights to not be discriminated against on the basis of your sex and race. You don't get to waive your rights to minimum wage. That's something that we have to have in order to have society function. So the big concern of government is both to make sure that people have the protections um, as well as to make sure that when we're talking about the safety net programs, um, the, the taxes piece of this, that everybody is actually buying into the system. Because those costs that are being saved, that 25%, those aren't getting, those aren't evaporating. Those are just getting shifted, right? If, if a person is working and they're not getting employment credit in Social Security, they're not covered by workers' comp, they're not covered by unemployment insurance, Something goes wrong, they lose that job, that contract gets terminated, they don't have access to those programs. Um, you know, they lose their home, they lose, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and there is no safety net available. There, there, a lot of that is really based on employee status, um, and that's why it happens to be in the payroll. Um, so that's that's a lot of what the government is caring about. Um, it's not really, a, I mean, when you're talking about the government, I mean, of course they care about revenue, but it's actually coming from a place of providing service um, that really does it will fall apart as a system if um, people are evading it. And that's not to say that there aren't, like I said, there are arrangements where it's completely legitimate. So the concern is the places where um, where it's really not. So in addition to this government concerns, there is though also the issue of wage theft. Absolutely. That is something that um, that is important uh, for workers if they are if they would be entitled to overtime, double time rest breaks and because they're independent contractors, they have none of those, then you know that would be considered wage theft. Absolutely. So the kinds of things, I think one of the things you guys wanted to hear about was how does somebody come to a person like me? What comes up? What are the issues? Um, the issues are um, often it's a, it's, it's a wage theft issue, often it's an issue where under the contractor arrangement, their um, method of compensation doesn't end up actually rising to minimum wage or they're working tons and tons and tons of hours and it's often the same employer, right? That's one of the factors. And they're not getting overtime. They're not getting, um, they're having to bear a lot of expenses that when you kind of dig into it, you think, wait, these are really company expenses and they're supposed to be getting reimbursed under the law or not. Um, so we see a wage theft issues. We see expenses issues. Um, any other kind of employment cause of action can come up, discrimination, um, Having labeled somebody as an employee, as a non-employee, isn't going to get you out of it if you have a discrimination problem. Um, but the reason it continues to concern me is that um, I think a lot of employees would actually be disincentivized from challenging it um, if they think that they they don't have the protection because they don't have that employee label. Um, as well as just sort of the more precarious your employment is, the harder it is to, to challenge anything, of course. Um, so I would say that's you know a lot of it. A lot of the biggest settlements we see or and judgments we see are in the wage and hour area. I think that's a lot of what was happening in the FedEx case, although I can't remember quite the um, the details. The details but I think right. it, I think it was wage and hour violations primarily, um, as well as 
you know, California has very strong penalties. So when we're talking about the scary stuff that can go wrong for the employer if you get it wrong, um, especially when you're making a business model decision and you're saying, this is kind of a wobbler, but I'm going to go with the independent contractor classification. Um, the California Labor Code has a section, you know, section 226.8, um, where for a willful violation, a willful misclassification of somebody as a non-employee is subject to a penalty of a minimum of $5,000 to $15,000 per violation. Um, and if it's found to be a pattern in practice, which basically if it's your business model, it's going to be a pattern in practice, it's $10,000 to $25,000 per violation. So that's going to be per hiring decision. So if you have one of these businesses where there's a lot of turnover, you've got people who work for you for a few months and then they leave, and that's part of why you went with the 1099 model, you're going to have more violations racking up because you've got more and more people coming through. Um, so that's something that, you know, I love the language that Tom Perez used, but I mean, California is serious about this. So let me understand that. So if, if one has 20 contractors, and, and one is found by California to have classified them as contractors when they should be employees. So they, they, they find be, that it's a misclassification. Right, so 20 people mm -hmm. times $10,000 per person. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a lot of money. It adds up really fast. Yeah, that, yeah it, it adds up. It balances out that save money. I mean, it's, it's if it's willful. There's one other step you forgot to, which is in violation, which is if it's your second offense on the federal level, you have to, you can go to prison. Yeah. No. <laughs> which is and, and we should also say that there are different governmental entities that look at this classification or misclassification issue. We have the IRS that looks at this. We have the EDD that looks at this. We have the California Labor Commissioner that looks at this. And we have the U.S. Department of Labor that looks at this. And they can look at it uh, just looking at one worker, best case scenario. Uh, or they can say, we're going to audit your entire business. And then they go in, and then it gets expensive. And they can do this. And if you've been on the hit list one time, they will come back. Um, some governmental entities have probably, and I don't know this, this is my speculation, they probably have a dial of the people that are repeat offenders. They come back like clockwork. Every one or two years they come back for another audit to make sure you complied with the last thing they were there for and you're just on some list. Um, certainly with the EDD, that's been my experience. They're very good um, at, at coming back because maybe those are the low-hanging fruits because they found stuff last time. It's sometimes the same investigator that comes back. So they have an intricate knowledge of that business already. So, you know, when, in particular when we're talking about uh, new business <coughs> models, they're very hard to learn for government. They have to learn all of this, and they have to assess the, the, the uh, you know, what, what should have been paid and what wasn't paid. And that's not very obvious sometimes. And so they love the repeat business of a business that already um, surfaced once as a problem because they already figured it out and then they come back. So just want you to, to not be scared, but be mindful of that. <laughs> yeah, the, um, the penalties section in California also provides that in addition to the penalties, you also have to post a notice in a place that is visible to both employees and the public that you've been found to have violated it and what the procedures are for you know, making a correction or making a one other cause of action that I wanted to mention is actually, it's, it's, it's a commercial one, which is, but we bring it in employment cases, um, which is um, unfair competition. So California has, um, has a statute that prohibits unfair competition of various kinds. And um, one of the ways that your competition can be unfair is if it's illegal. And so if you're undercutting your competition via an illegal cost-saving strategy, then um, that can be an, an additional violation which can increase your liability and it can extend the statute of limitations on the underlying violation. So that's something that we, as, um, as attorneys, whether it's in a misclassification context or not, but where it's you know, a wage and hour case, for example, um, that's, another, that's another thing to know about. And a thing to think about as a business person, I like to bring that up because 
you know, everybody wants an edge, and that's very understandable. Uh, but you know, there's boundaries around what kinds of advantages you're allowed to get over your competition. I've got to know your numbers, the balance too. Um, on the international platform, I'm curious if you, I don't know if you'll bring up Holland again, but um, <laughs> I'll I'll pick up Holland. Holland. Well, I, I should pick on Holland because Holland will beat England tonight in football. Oh. So, so I'll, <laughs> leave I'll leave them. I'll leave them. Right. We'll go on to Germany because we did beat you 3 2. We did. Yeah, yeah, just um, <laughs> so, I have to. We, it will happen about once every 50 years. So. Um, but it, on the Joe, on the, uh, on the, on the German uh, front, um, I think, first of all, uh, from speaking with um, uh, one of the partners earlier on today in, uh, in Germany, I think his view was that actually in Germany the majority of independent contract relationships are probably, um, you know, they are independent, contra independent contract relationships. Um, a, lot of, a lot with sort of the, you know, if we call them millennials, so younger generation, and I think the risk of claims there is, is relatively low. Um, but when they do have a claim, um, just in terms of sort of penalties, uh, intentional or not, is, is very, very crucial. Um, if it is intentional misclassification, then there are potential criminal charges. Um, and also, uh, if, it's, if, it's, if it's intentional, then your liability for all the unpaid social security and tax will go back to the start of when you engage that person, uh, whereas, there's a, whereas it might only be four years. So, um, it's a case where they had where um, you know, the differential was equivalent to about 600,000 um, US dollars on that case if, if, you know, if, we'd, if we'd lost. Um, we didn't. But um, in terms of other potential uh, penalties, if you look at Turkey, for example, just on the wage and hour front, um, so if you've got someone that claims to be an employee and, and you haven't been paying them the right sort of, you know, the, the, uh, national minimum wage or the right wages, um, then they actually have a, a system whereby there is a uh, five percent daily interest rate on unpaid wages that goes back. Um, and you really, you, and the, the really nasty thing is there that um, you can try and sort it out as a as a company in Turkey, but if you you know I think you call them releases over here. Um, if you think you've come to a valid release, unless it's caught back, it's not enforceable. So you can have paid, you know, whatever it is, twenty thousand equivalent to what you think to set things okay, but actually they can still come back and issue a claim against you and then you're still on the hook. So there are some potentially, I think just the other point to, to bear in mind is the political situation is always a factor. So in the UK, if you're looking at a test for an employee um, or, 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 or not, then the broad sort of heads you're looking at are exclusivity, so do they work for that person alone? Um, are they controlled in terms of what they do and how they do it? Is it a mutuality of obligations? So, is there an obligation on the employer to offer them work and for the employee to do it? And risk. So, who you know, who bears the risk of going to work? Do they get the money regardless? Um, but uh, you know, I think certainly it is a backdrop at the moment. You probably read about the UK cases uh, involving this is corporation tax involving some fairly large companies where some deals have been come to. Um, and whilst yeah, I think you probably look, this is where US and Europe are probably aligned. There's probably under-resourced and under-funded um, enforcement sort of bodies, uh, which is why they probably go back for the you know the low-hanging fruit of people that have been found guilty once. Um, the H and Revenue and Customs um, are on a real drive in in, uh, in England to to recover uh, um, you know tax or, or social security. So they will they will take a more draconian starts to who's an employee or who's not an employee, then the employment tribunals will. So you can have your employment tribunal saying, no, it's fine. We understand that you know, he, she was a contractor. But then the Asian Revenue and Customs say, well, it doesn't bind us. Kind of unlike it's Well, then you're into an expensive battle with, and you, know, you can get those in turn. But um, there are, you know, there are sort of, there are sort of uh, you know, quite serious, I suppose, sort of similar uh, consequences. Um, in the UK as well, we have um, a system whereby now the government have introduced each year they name and shame um, companies uh, that don't pay national minimum wage, that employ illegal workers, so you know, people that are employed without proper visas and all the rest of it. Now, you don't want to be one of those companies. <laughs> Trust me. Um, th th there's a company called Sports Direct in, in England, which is huge. Um, do low-cost um, sportswear, very, very successful. Well. They've been oppressed a lot 
through their use of agency workers and what we call zero hours contracts. So it's having employees or workers, but you only need them as and when. So it's a kind of hybrid, almost, of your contractor and employer employee relationship. Well, they've had a lot of scrutiny on that. Um, and once you get into sort of the, the sites of certain people, you know, they're being the, the head of that company is being asked to go to Parliament to attend um, hearings to discuss the working practices, how they engage people. There's another side to it as well because of allegations that they're all being kept in houses, um, you know, essentially sort of, you know, 10, 15 people in the house. Now, you know, that's all a, a sort of side issue, but it just shows, I think, once you get on, you know, once you get on the radar of people, um, then you know, they're not going to let it go. Um, and that's just going to detract, particularly if you're you know, a, a sort of smaller business, you don't want to be wasting your time. It's enough to do with running a business rather than having to go along and explain yourself to some official who you probably don't like. And on the note of walk of shame, I don't know if anyone followed the, the UC Regents uh, issue um, just recently where the janitorial workers um, were all, uh, they, they were not employees of um, UC, instead they were with staffing firms that had notorious um, wage and hour and other labor violations. And the several professors staged protests, canceled meetings, and that made the press, and that put pressure on UC to bring all these janitorial workers at, the, at UC Berkeley in-house. So that was sort of the, the, the pressure of the shame um, that, that did it in, in bringing these um, low-wage workers in-house and, and making them employees. I thought it was interesting. She got a ribbon. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that brings up one, one point that I wanted to make sure we make is that um, using an agency is not a magic bullet. Um, that comes with solutions. Hold your thought. Oh, oh sure, perfect. That's hold your thought. <laughs> Great. Okay. So, and, and because there, there's, a, there's a deeper issue, it's actually a, a, you know, one solution that seems like a solution isn't one. <laughs> and you'll raise that. But let's um, hear from Darren because Darren went through the experience of a government investigation that he's willing to talk about. And I really think that that's very beneficial to some of you to, to sort of see the experience, how, um, how it is from sort of the business perspective of, to go through that experience. Darren, uh, what really, can you share? It's really fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a rule you, you, you forgot, which is workers provide their own equipment and they kind of judge you on that. Yeah, I well. definitely didn't mention all the facts, so. you guys. <laughs> call a lawyer, call a lawyer. 20 steps. <laughs> it's like 17, yeah. So, um, my, my investigation was basically caused by someone who didn't pay their, their taxes. They were independent contractors and they failed to file. Um, I filed a 1099 mis, uh, mis, miscellaneous, whatever it's called. Um, I did file it, but I didn't say whatever it was called. It was 1099. Um, and uh, what happened is that she filed, they wanted to do a termination of worker status to the IRS. So that was an SSA. So I went and hired an attorney to go through this process. And the IRS process is really easy. I mean, you basically show up and you say, okay, I might have misclassified someone. You enter a voluntary classification program. I think that's actually what it's called, BCP. Um, you pay a fee, and it's completely like minimal as compared to what the whole uh, payment is going to be. And I thought that was at the end of it. But then I think you had mentioned, Robert, uh, you know, there's different agencies that come in. Yeah. And that was the next step, which was the Department of Labor, which is the Federal Department of Labor. Also, as you guys had mentioned, yeah. I, I viewed all at angles of this. Um, the other thing you mentioned is that a, 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 a disgruntled yeah. independent contractor is, if not as bad as an employee, I, I would say that it's probably way worse. worse. Yeah. <laughs> because I started, once I started to go down the road of converting these people into, uh, these workers into employees, W-2s, um, I was only registered in California. So to do that, I just started terminating the contracts in, around the United States. Well, when I started doing that, then I started getting claims from workers' comp, discrimination claims, uh, Department of Labor, different states, mm -hmm. unemployment. I mean, I was just fielding all these different um, entities, and um, that sucked, <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, the one that stuck, though, was the, the Department of Labor, and um, also Robert mentioned the word draconian, and I completely agree with that. He had applied to the Department of Labor as well. Um, you know, it, it starts off as a horrible feeling because I literally, when I was called, I was making hamburgers for my current employees, 
at my house to take for an employee appreciation party that evening. So, um, my web developer is calling me because you know he usually calls me when bad things happen with our servers. And so I was looking at the websites. The websites were fine. I checked, went onto the servers. Everything looks like it's fine. Then I got a call from one of the other editors in the other room. And literally, it was like the Wolf of Wall Street. So uh, basically, we had three investigators come in. One that was, um, I don't know, I heard he was armed. I wasn't there. I don't know. <laughs> but there was uh, a person that was basically a really technical supervisor that was going to be able to go through any of the computers to find any data or whatnot. And then this other woman who um, basically was hell-bent on taking the, the, the man down. Uh -huh. um, and you know, like. I know exactly the, the, the worker that kind of went and started this whole process, and um, you know, when it was quite obvious when we were going through the investigation that she thought, the investigator thought, that we were much bigger than we originally were. So when I spoke to uh, the, the previous worker uh, before, um, she said, well, you, you've got to be one of the biggest editing firms in the United States. And I'm like, well, okay, maybe, I don't know. I mean, how big do you think that is? And so I said, you know, you know, to give you an idea of order of magnitude, there's mega cap, there's like Google's of the world and that kind of Apple, you know, and there's medium caps, small caps, micro caps, nano caps, mid cap, I don't know, you know, mid market, and just kind of going down the line. She said, oh, easily you're a mid cap guys, it's a, a mid cap type company. And I was like, man, I, I told you the other day I was putting together an IKEA desk. Like, you show me the CEO <laughs> of a company that's putting together a desk. And, you know. So I think kind of when she started going down uh, this road to tell this investigator, and it sounds like by the mandate of, I forget the guy's name, but uh, I mean, you know, oh, wow, look, you know, I can throw a rock because we're located right over here. And from the Department of Labor, it's really easy to get over to my office from there. So she walked over and just thought that she was really going to, you know, Get, get this one big case here. Um, so to go through like the rules, when we first started going through those rules, and we kind of went through and you know, since you have control, um, yep, well, the control looks like uh, you don't, you have control. I've, I've seen emails. Okay, I've seen emails. And, uh, are these people skilled? You know, I think that actually favored in, in favor of us because they were skilled. They have a very unique skill set. They're college educated. Uh, the worker provides their own equipment. The reason why that sticks in my head is because she said that they didn't really provide their own equipment because everyone's got a computer and the style books are, uh, are, are minimal cost. And I thought as soon as she said that, I'm like, oh, wow, I'm dead. Because, I mean, how can you say that their computer doesn't count? Well, they don't come with, like, a you know, big cement truck. Um, <laughs> they've got to pick their own schedule, which in our case they totally did. But then they said since we selected the four-hour bands of time, that didn't really apply because we were, so we were making the four-hour period. Um, opportunity for profit and loss. Uh, they did have the opportunity for profit and loss. The more they work, they can make more money. They can get the more lucrative documents depending on the hours they worked. But because uh, we picked kind of the bands of what the client negotiated with us, which is basically determined by uh, the projects, uh, they felt that they weren't really able to, to negotiate their own profit and loss as much. Um, and then, you know, are these people integral to our business? In this case, they were editors, and that is clearly integral to the part of our business. Unfortunately, like I was also in the process of growing our business too. Eventually, I, I never got to it yet, but it, it, the translations, transcriptions, and you can use legal as one, one of the areas, kind of similar to like what LegalZoom has done. You can do it for any type of kind of on-demand workforce. Um, you know, I started in 2001, so there, there, I hadn't even thought of it, any of these things until you know, we got in trouble for it. But, um, and then the permanency of the workers' relationship was the other one that kind of got us too, uh, which is that I just didn't keep up with the contracts going through that. It's very dynamic. We've got you know 50,000 clients, and so the business grows. I don't have the time to go and renegotiate all the different contracts. So to go through that whole process was horrible in itself. But then once it was determined that you know okay these people were misclassified, I had the, the, the wonderful opportunity to defend myself in federal court, which was not really an opportunity. An opportunity or an option at that point it's extremely expensive and there was no point for me to really to, to, to go and fight who cares if I'm right or wrong I'm going to be you know out of business by, by that time um, so then it just kind of opened up this whole looking at these first of all I didn't have any time cards for them so I had no idea how I could possibly go back and rebuild their time cards because we didn't have any time cards so literally like I dug through some of our database was able to pull in their logins when they logged in and out of the website and it, it took us, um, I don't know, months to just basically figure out 
you know, what the violations even were. Um, and then the other reason I know about prison is because that was brought up to me and I thought that was really funny because I thought, here these people are making all this money and you know they're going to send me to prison for sort of giving them a, a check, or a nice big fat check, and I thought if that's the case then I'm going to get a tattoo across my chest that says thug life because that's how ridiculous <laughs> that, that thought came across my mind. So, um, I mean, the violations, though, are very stiff. You've kind of already touched on them. $10,000, I mean, $1,000 for each violation you know, is the first time. And the second, the second conviction would result in that. But the reason why I, I, I know that is because that was one of the things the investigator decided. When she looked at all the data and she decided that there really wasn't any violations, I mean, that she could really sink her teeth into to put us up on a wall and that we weren't a mid-cap size company. She threw that out at the last second. She said that, okay, now we're going to go for willfulness because you definitely were misclassifying these people on purpose and we're really trying to, you know, want to make an, uh, ex you know, an example of you. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was just ludicrous. I mean, like, you know, I mean, I started this, this company as a, as, a, as a college project when I was in graduate school and here now I'm like, after giving people employment, or not employment, oh, that's a wrong word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Service contract. Yes, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, they, everyone was happy. Like, no one was, uh, it, this didn't even come out as a good in outcome for anyone right, during this whole investigation. And during that time, I couldn't grow my business. You're treated as a criminal. Um, you know, basically, it's the opposite of the, the, the legal system where you're proven, uh, you're guilty until proven innocent. Um, and. I mean, that's just kind of like the high level of like the investigation, but I, totally different by different department. Because like the IRS was, I want to say, pleasant to work with, but they were pleasant to work with. Um, so fortunately, I haven't had any other interactions with them, them since then. But, um, you know, going back to like, I think someone said that, you know, reporting um, your competitors, I don't know who said that, but I did. I went back and went through all the competitors' lists, all on everyone's website since I was one of the first people to. Uh, start that business, they literally copied all my employment stuff on other websites. I just copied, sent it over, and so this falls under rule one, two, three, and I just sent it to her, and I got a letter back from her saying, oh, thank you for the, the leads. <laughs> I mean, why should I have to follow all those rules if no one else has to as well? So the whole the whole investigation it just was horrible. Um, it was a huge strain to the business. You can focus on running the business, which is what you wanted to do. Right. You had to focus on getting all the evidence, which wasn't focused on one person, right? It was broad. I think it was across like a hundred some odd people spanning back five years. And you know, I didn't even have a lot of the data that she was asking for. I mean, I had to go to like a test server where we had taken a snapshot of our database from like three years ago, and this was sitting like under my desk at my house, you know, and it was just randomly there. And we rebuilt, you know, time cards, and there was days that she looked at it, and she said, okay, this person, you didn't give them minimum wage. On that same day, you didn't give them overtime because they worked 60 hours. And I'm like, this is like, how can I be done wrong on both sides? And none of this was because, like, um, you know, we weren't paying them, it was just because these contracts were severed, and now these people had no other place to go for, for compensation. Um, I think the funniest part, though, is that the, one of the, the violations that we had, the person who started the whole claim, I think she got $70. So, I mean, like, at the end of the day, she got a whopping $70, and I think another person, I think the high mark was, like, 4000 or something like that. But, I mean, like, nothing of this was, like, life-changing for any of these people. Like, they weren't going to walk away 20 years, like, 20 years of salary sounds, like, ludicrous to me. I would, would just leave the other ones right now. <laughs> You also can't um, you can't dismiss someone in the Netherlands unless it's been a court sanctioned either. Just to you know, for those of you thinking of setting up in the Netherlands, <laughs> just a few points to bear in mind. Even if you've got a bad reason, so even if they, you know, they, they've done some some very bad things. Yeah. So the, the investigation was horrible, and uh, to throw it all down there. But you got out of it, and, and actually we should, uh, for lack of time, we should move into the solutions portion. And, and you know, I want to put Margot on the spot. So can one, is there never a situation where you can use independent contractors? No. <laughs> no, we talked about that a little bit already. I mean, I think, you know, you if, if it's at all questionable, which a lot of them are, you know, I really encourage you to hire somebody like Simone or David walk through it, what are you picturing, how is this going to operate. Um, a lot of these things happen because, and I don't mean to come down on you, Darren, but because they're not thought 
through with the, from the beginning of how is this going to work when it's not just me and two other people, but it's 100 people. And the more you scale, and the more you operationalize and mechanize, the, the more likely it's going to start looking like employment um, and not independent contractors. But there's absolutely times that it is appropriate when you have specialized skills or you have legitimately that person is in business and it's not that they're spending all their time working for you or you're a customer or a client kind of a relationship. Um, even if you're a major client, <laughs> um, that can be legitimate. Specialized skills where the flexibility is legitimate and it's two-way mm -hmm. and there's a real negotiation there. Um, those are the times that I would tend to think you know, it's appropriate and where I see abuses is when it's an attempt to evade uh, the responsibilities that are in place for people who really are um, providing services that are generating profit for your business and the, that comes with responsibilities on the part of the employer. Um, so absolutely there are gray areas here um, and there are, black, there are areas that are black and white as well. I'll just say one more thing. Um, a lot of the people that were working for me or were misclassified did hold themselves out as independent contractors and actually did have their own company, their own tax IDs. I wrote checks to people that were independent contractors through their own company and I didn't tell them to set it up. So that's not a bulletproof yeah, you know, yeah, that's yeah. to say that, oh no, they're a contractor. So. And UC hiring a staffing agency for the janitorial, you know, that didn't get UC out of. Right, yeah. so talk about that for a second. Of, it's, yeah. it, so that, you know, appears to be a solution. If I have a whole group of people and I don't want to employ them. I just hire somebody, and then put it through them. I yep. I'm scotch free. <laughs> why, why doesn't it work? It doesn't work primarily because of the um, under most under most of the rubrics that are most of the sort of enforcement type situations that you're going to have tax and employment protections. There are there's such a thing as a joint employer. I mean, mm -hmm. people can work for more than one employer at exactly the same moment. Um, so very often that staffing agency might be their employer, but so mm -hmm. is the company that the staffing agency is um, is the providing services for. Um, so if the person if the person doing the work is serving your company, having added a layer in there is not necessarily a protection. So you need to know what the company that you hired is doing with its workers because ultimately you're holding that bag. Yes. And there are good ones and bad ones. I'm sure <laughs> and fake ones. That's the, way. <laughs> the real ones. So. so in uh, in Europe, there's been um, systemic abuse of agency workers, and it's slightly from a slightly different angle actually. Um, agency workers have traditionally been, I think, paid a lot less than their employee equivalents. So there's um, a directive that was brought in in the EU that now means that if you have agency workers who work with you for, for more than 12 weeks you know, by the agency, then they are entitled to sort of similar equivalent terms and conditions for, for most um, for most things like pay uh, and, and benefits compared to your sort of their full time or part time employee equivalent. So that's probably that's been the issue really on agency workers in um, in Europe. Um, I think in terms of uh, sort of solutions, I think it's very very difficult. I, mean, I think in Europe, the existing classifications work, um, and I think they're. they're Spain and Canada have introduced a, a, a sort of a concept which is the um, dependent contractor whereby you have someone that works for someone for, for more than 75% of their time or 80% or in Canada um, and they're entitled to some annual leave, um, they get insurance paid for health and safety risks and insurance in case, in case they um, are, are, you know, are terminated um, and I think in, I think in Canada uh, you might even get sort of a, you know, a limited period of notice that you're entitled to. Um, I suppose I'm not entirely comfortable with those as concepts. I think if we're talking about sharing economy, the whole idea is that you actually, if you're if you're a contractor, you're able to work for A, B, and C. So you know, if you're limited to spending any percent of your time, it's very different to, 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 to draw lines between um, dependent contractor, independent contractor, and employee. Um, right, they might get their holiday, but then. Could have exactly the same issues when dependent contractor says no actually I was an employee. Um, so I think the I think the classifications work, I think it's a very difficult um, area which you know continues continues to be sort of drilled down, down into by case law. Um, but I, I think I, I'd echo some other comments, I think it's probably just just worthwhile um, you know certainly if you're operating here in the US just making sure that you're comfortable with how you classify people and equally if you're going to set up in um, or have someone open up a, a branch in wherever it might be, France or somewhere, then 
it is worth just double checking that you're um, you are complying with the um, the local laws. Um, you know, some, some some countries will have got you know, quite strict um, criminal charges, let alone some fines. So um, I think the you know the classifications. I think it's very hard to if you start introducing more classifications, then I think what's already a difficult topic when it's being fought out will just become you know will become essentially sort of um, esoteric differences. Jennifer wants to jump in. Yeah, one, one important point, I think, coming back to kind of solutions and, and what, what we've always done within the business is really look at what is the mindset of the person that we want. And, and for a particular skill, let's say it's web design or compensation plan development or organizational planning, a very specific skill. We define the skill, but we also look for, in order to bring in a contractor to do that project, we look for somebody that is independent-minded, that really wants and is committed to this independent life and has their company, and that's their commitment. I mean, we use a rule that they have to have had a business of their own, working in an independent manner for quite some period of time, and have the references to support it that say that they're they're not interested in a job, they have no desire for a paid vacation, they, they do not expect unemployment when they complete an assignment and they go on to their next gig. It, it's a different mindset kind of animal that is, in my opinion, the true independent contractor. So looking for that mindset while also being very, very careful and extremely diligent on managing the contracts and making sure all the legalese is in the contracts and doing whatever one can in one's power to avoid the one disgruntled person that happens to unintentionally file for unemployment or call the labor board by accident, which, which can happen. Trying to avoid that, look for the mindset, and get the contracts in order. Uh, the other, the rebel on the team. <laughs> Do you have a thought? Um, you know, one of my my quotes I wanted to get up here was that in the last quarter of 2013, there are 4.3 million of us that earn our own crust, crust and are officially self-employed. So, you know, my my comment is that, and I'll, I'll just caveat this: I'm Canadian. I'm a dual citizen, but I was born a Canadian, and so, you know, I'm. I was personally very frustrated when I moved to the U.S. that you know, when I leave a company, I have to change my doctor. That was like a what moment for me. Um, you know, and if we had a universal safety net, it would allow more flexibility that workers want. And there are more and more people that want to be self-employed. But I mean, I have tons of friends who are W-2s. They're like, oh, I wish I could do what you do, but I'm afraid to do that because they're afraid to give up these things that they can only get in this country as a W-2 employee. So that's just my political statement. If we had a universal <laughs> safety net, then this would make all of this so much easier because we could have protection for workers that wasn't tied to their job. Are you endorsing any candidates? I'm just trying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anyone well. promoting that particular issue, but for me, you know, health care and, and all those safety nets that surround workers, I just think it's abominable, but it's tied to your job. That's a good point. It's a very good point. It's abominable. I mean, yeah. if someone loses their job, now you've got to find a new it doctor for you and your baby. It's like, oh, let's just pile on. Yeah. You know, now you don't know how you're going to pay for your mortgage payment, and now you've got to find a new doctor for your sick kid. First, you have to read the health plan. Yeah. Yeah. Those are fun to exactly, read. Exactly, <laughs> which I never understand. So that was my political statement about, you know, I think that, that, that we need to have some... <laughs> I, I, I don't do a 1099 model to, to take advantage of it. I do it to take advantage of getting great people who have specialized skill sets who really focus on our clients. I would love to be able to also know that they have protections, aside from typically, to be honest, it's their husband who's a W-2. You're getting to my last question, but I want to ask Darren, but um, the W-2 model, does that work at all? I mean, you did the switch and you talked about the pain. But you sit here, you look, you know, it's happy. All and it's, it's, all it's, all it's all ponies and rainbows from here on out. I can just switch to W2 and it's great. Um, it, it was really, it really, it was a big struggle because uh, 
first of all, I want to say like when, when we switched, originally we had contractors working for us, even though I said that everyone was happy, and this might be like because when I look at our glass door ratings from our old company, it was a 1.2. Um, but that was right after I cut the contracts. Um, <laughs> I will say, like right now, though, uh, with our current W two employees, we have a, a, a four point two rating out of five. So our employees are really happy. Um, basically, we've gone and um, did a little bit of different model. So when we first did it, we tried to do the Google approach, where we just did hourly pay, and people complained that the coffee was, you know, not bicycle coffee, and they wanted whatever other awesome coffee it was, and people were concerned about bean bags and whatnot. Hence why they were only editing 4,000 words per day. <laughs> but when we ended up switching it to uh, kind of like a more um, hybrid model as far as like, uh, it's like a kind of like a, a bonus structure versus um, an hourly structure, it really tied, it started to work to get the incentives back out. And we tried several of them. The first one we did did not work. The second, I think it was like the third iteration that it finally started to work and started to get us back on track. Um, but you know, from, from that standpoint, you know, now we've got uh, our, our employees are now going to end up getting health care benefits later on this year. Um, it's been hard to do that since we have only 30 employees and they're all in different states. Um, once you get everyone set up in QuickBooks or whatnot for the employment uh, process, it's not really that difficult. It's not any more scalable. I originally I thought maybe having 1099s would be way more scalable. It's no different. Once you have like everyone set up in the QuickBooks system or payroll system, whatever you do, it's not hard to do. And so therefore now we have happier employees, our clients are happier because they're not getting different um, editors working on their stuff. It's much more reliable instead of having 75 employees, uh, or contractors, sorry. Um, uh, you know, we have 30 uh, employees and it seems to work pretty well. Um, and it, but it took a long time to do that switch. I mean, my advice would be that if you're starting a new business today, there's absolutely zero reason that you would use 1099s. Like, it makes no sense. This is, they're gonna go away, just face it, and you know, just <laughs> get used to it. And if your business fails on the W two or at the W two, who cares? Like start another one. We're all entrepreneurs, right? Like I mean, you have I already have like nine ideas in my head right now. Like I mean, I, not to say that I want it to fail, but I mean like, <laughs> <laughs> like you just you, that's the mark for true entrepreneur. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you just yeah. I'm not I don't want it to be like sitting around doing the same thing over and over again. So I mean, as long as you get the W twos all set up, I think you. So the, so the lack of incentives, so with your uh, original independent contractor model, you had a lot of incentive, and that's what you liked, and that's what motivated people, and it took a while, and it was a hard transition, but you got that back, and you did that still with the W-2 yep. program, and it's just a matter of figuring it out. It's not brain surgery. There is a way to figure it out, and then you incentivize workers just the same way you did before, yet right. they have those protections, the safety nets, and the government will leave you alone. Right, cool. And also, like, you know, going back to all those seven things there, I mean, like, control, it's like, would you want someone you don't have control over? You just have them on a whim and they can kind of go when they please, you know? I mean, like, all the, all the, if you go through all those seven things and really think, like, do you really want those people running your company and being the face of your company with giving you bad reputation? Like, I don't know why you would do that. It just seems like, for us, it was just we already grew the business that way, so it was more kind of we're entrenched in that, that method, you know? But, go back and do a W-2, it was fine though. Good. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, now I come to my last questions because we're out of time and then I want to give you all an opportunity to, to ask questions. But uh, do you think that the laws as they are on the books uh, today sufficiently address the new economic reality, this new economic worker model um, that, that requires more flexibility? And we'll just go down the road. I'll start with you. I would say that, that from what I understand of the laws, it's not so much the law that needs to change, but it's a greater understanding of how to apply the law. Because the younger generation, the entrepreneurial minded, the person that wants flexibility, that wants and demands and will be in control of what he or she does, wants to have their own PC, work in the middle of the night, that kind of a mindset, there's more of those coming. So it's, I think, for the company that would bring that person in as a contractor, it's really to have an understanding of when and how to leverage that mindset and that type of structure in the proper independent contractor model 
and when and how to leverage a different kind of animal as a W-2. So opportunities like this of sharing and just a greater understanding is the thing I would suggest investment in, per se, more than changing the law. Margo? Yeah, I agree. I think Robert's point that adding an additional in-between phase, just it, that I don't think that helps anybody apply it. When you're drawing finer and finer lines, I think that it you know, really adds enforceability difficulty. I think that makes it that much harder to comply. I don't really think it's likely to reduce abuse. I think where I hear, I mean, I'm obviously coming from the employee side of this, um, and I tend to see it in the situations where it's become abusive. I don't think that that helps that. Um, I also really strongly agree with Jennifer's point that part of part of what's going on here, part of why we need those protections, that there are certain elements of the safety net that the government's concerned with and I'm concerned with that are some of the reasons that they care about the classification. Maybe we could provide those another way that wasn't via the employer. The current system we have, so much people's health care, workers comp, if everybody just could get care for, then we wouldn't have to worry so much about workers' comp. We wouldn't worry so much about the difference between getting sued under workers' comp and getting sued for negligence. Um, you know, some of that stuff, if you can decouple that 